So my name is Jeff Leifer, and this is a panel about storytelling in the connected age, the age of new connectivity. We're going to, we intentionally kept this panel small so we could have some real conversation with each other and with you in the audience. So don't be shy when the time comes. Uh, this is a, a broad topic, and it's a topic that is not something that pops up at, at most uh, capital markets conferences. So I really feel this is a positive sign, um, the direction that this community is moving. Um, it's all because of the crowdsourced ideas that come from the SOCAP community. And I'm really excited to have uh, Jonas Sachs from Free Range Studios and Jesse Shapins from Ziga here today. A lot of people wanted to be on this panel. And we kept, I kept saying no so I could have them to myself and to yourself. Um, so there's a lot of directions that we could go with this topic, and we don't really have time to cover all the possible uh, pathways. But some of the things we're going to be touching on today are, are really around how storytelling is, is even more than a tool for narrative framing and for you know, expressing the, the values-driven communications that we all are you know, engaged in and encouraging our communities to um, to participate in. So uh, just even that, just understanding storytelling as a tool um, for communication would be enough. But, but Jonas Sachs is going to talk about how it goes so much further and how these universal um, themes are, are timeless and, 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 and resonant and how um, there's certain key elements that are going to determine who, who wins the, uh, the battles, if you will, of the, the story memes and, and, the, and the grand mythos and how do we, how do we reach communities that uh, we want to with the messages we're trying to tell. Uh, so um, Jesse Shapins is going to be talking about literally one of the most audacious undertakings as well. Uh, While well, Joan has been revolutionary with free range and defining a whole new space, Jesse Shapins and Ziga and his team are, are revolutionaries in terms of literally remaking the internet. Completely uh, ambitious uh, vision and as um, far as I can see, it's working, but uh, of course the jury's still out. So we're going to start with Jonah, and I just want to say a quick word about him. And, and each Jesse and Jonah will introduce a little bit more about themselves, do a brief introduction with some materials, so just to give a little touch in around uh, some of the issues that they're interested in. And then we're going to jump right into conversations. We only have 60 minutes, so the intros will be kind of short. Uh, real straightforward and casual around Jonah. Uh, Jonah is a co-founder of uh, Free Range Studios and Creative Managing Director. And uh, as I say, has just revolutionized the space of working with uh, progressive nonprofits primarily in telling their story and really identifying the story brand, creating narrative framing, uh, and executing on, on communications, and then building the infrastructure that's needed to, uh, to really realize the true potential of those messages, not just to have the message out there in the in the noosphere, but to actually have infrastructure to harness the energy that's, that's generated from these, these impact campaigns and, and communication strategies. So um, Jonah has you know, put his thoughts down at the request of a number of publishers, including Harvard Business Review Press, uh, and written this wonderful book called Story Wars, uh, Why Those Who Tell and Live the Best Stories Will Rule the Future illustrated by this wonderful illustrator who's in-house at uh, Free Range Studios in, in, uh, in Oakland, in the East Bay. This is a fantastic book. I read it, I love it, and I really am hoping Jonah will talk to us about what's in it a bit today. And um, some of this uh, conversation is around brands, but brands in the most expansive meaning of that word. So whether you're involved in a, a venture startup, uh, an educational NGO, or, um, or a technology company, the idea of brand, uh, I'm sure, is not lost on you, and how to, how to really uh, fashion that based on uh, universal and deep archetypes is, is part of the message of this book. I really loved it. So, Jonah, I'm going to hand it over to you. Sure. Uh, yeah. So, thanks, Jeff. Um, my work has been about trying to figure out how to change the world through storytelling since 1999. And um, at that time, I realized, as the internet was starting to fall into everybody's hands, that our media landscape was fundamentally changing, and that that broadcast model was starting to fall away, and that soon people would be able to pass messages along uh, of passion as seamlessly and frictionlessly 
as brand messages were being passed around. And I knew at that time that this could revolutionize the world of, of social change and that we had to harness these tools and quickly before big corporations took them over and made them uh, just another tool for consumer advertising. And so the last 13 years of Free Range has just been an exploration of how to get people uh, to, speak, to speak to their passions through their social networks. And that's why projects like the story of Stuff and the Matrix have reached 20 million people with no actual platform uh, to speak of. And in doing that work, I've seen how certain stories just resonate and blow up the social media space and other stories are forgotten. And as I've learned what works and what doesn't, I've stepped back and begun to help people who are building enterprises see that these story patterns, these ancient story patterns in human beings, um, don't just work for getting a point across, but for giving purpose to an enterprise, to, a, as, as I say, brand. Um, but it can be the enterprise of a, of a single leader, the enterprise of a, a social change network, or of a consumer products brand. And so what I've been doing recently is really trying to help people see how their own stories and their organization stories um, create these giant epics and how to understand the uh, underlying structures of those epics. So I'm gonna show just a, a four minute video here that gives you a sense of what a story actually is, why they're so important right now, and how uh, enterprises are built on stories. And I think it'll be helpful for framing uh, the conversation that we have going forward. We humans have always been obsessed with communicating. It's how we turn ideas into the glue that binds us together, into tribes and societies. In oral traditions, an idea spreads from person to person. Everyone briefly owns it, modifies it, and can choose to pass it through social networks or let it die. It's survival of the fittest, and only the most compelling ideas thrive. But the last hundred years of the broadcast era changed all that. Here, audiences became consumers of ideas, not participants in spreading them. Brands and causes with access to broadcast could guarantee attention. It became survival of the richest. Now that the broadcast era is ending, what will come next? With audiences again in charge of what ideas they seek, skip, and pass along, we are entering a time that looks like a digitally empowered version of the oral tradition. The digitoral era. Here it's survival of the fittest again. And what kind of ideas survive in any oral tradition? Stories. It's time we all became storytellers again. But how? It starts by thinking of your brand itself as a story. Every communication you create is another chapter in an unfolding epic starring you and your audience. On the surface of any story, you'll find characters, settings, conflict. None of these things are placed there by chance. Every visible element of a well-told story is there to illustrate a core truth about the world, a moral of the story. Morals are themselves expressions of values that the storyteller wants to share. Different values create vastly different morals and story surfaces. Joseph Campbell, who studied stories across cultures and millennia, discovered the most universally successful stories, or myths, call audiences to higher human values, like community, justice, truth, and self-expression. Campbell also uncovered the hero's journey, a formula for iconic storytelling that has always worked. We still see it everywhere, and it provides huge insights for a story-based brand. An unlikely hero, a powerless outsider, muddles through a broken world. She wants to live out her higher values, but feels powerless to do so. Then she meets a mentor who tells her so much more is possible. He gives her a magic gift and calls her to a dangerous adventure of self-discovery. On this adventure, she confronts the evil source of the world's brokenness and seizes a treasure with which she comes back to heal society. Audiences thrill to hear this story again and again. Brands can use this formula to become storytelling masters too. How? Start with the hero. This hero doesn't start out as the insider, the one with the power. She is an outsider to your brand. So, she's not you. The hero of your story is your audience. So if you're not the hero, who are you? The mentor. You are the character that reveals more is possible. You work to connect audiences to their deeper values. You teach a core truth, a moral of the story, that provides hope to heal a broken world. Stop talking about how great you are and start telling stories about how great your audience can be. And give them a magic gift, something that makes the adventure you are offering seem likely to succeed. A great brand gift has taken good story brands and made them cultural icons. Any brand can become a story brand by finding its relevance in its values, its consistency by building every communication around its moral. It finds resonance in its unique voice as mentor rather than hero, 
and its differentiator in its gift. But that's the easy part. In the transparent world of the digital era, mythic success will take something more, a commitment to live the higher values you espouse. Those that don't will lose credibility and their stories with it. Brands brave enough to live their values will reach iconic status and light up the digital landscape. They will tell the stories and create the myths that will win the story wars. Thank you. So, so I realized in going down this road of writing this book and exposing these ideas that I was doing something incredibly sacrilegious. I was leveraging Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, the Bhagavad Gita, the story of Moses, ancient Native American myths and legends in the service of marketing and branding. And uh, that made me pretty scared for a while. And I was thinking, is this the right thing to do? Is the right thing to take this sacred human art and use it for marketing? But one of the things I realized in this process is that marketers have become our modern myth makers. Um, the stories that give us purpose in our lives, the stories that give us ritual in our lives, the stories that tell us how the world works are primarily coming from marketers. And because they've created a marketing language steeped in this broadcast era in which the brand is the hero and the audience is the damsel in distress, in which the only way to be happy is through consumption, um, in which these ancient storytelling tools are twisted and used in ways uh, for pretty nefarious purposes and speaking to our lower values, they've taken over our mythic landscape. And that marketers who have a, uh, a belief in changing the world need to learn to use these tools and these ancient uh, mythic properties in order to create uh, new kinds of communications. And what I'm excited about is that in this world where everyone gets to decide what messages to pass, we're gonna to return to this time where we have a preference for stories that speak to higher values, as Campbell said, oral, all oral traditions did. We're gonna to return to a preference for stories that empower us to be the heroes in our own lives, as all oral tradition societies have preferred. And companies in this transparent era who use this methodology or any story methodology are gonna find out that at the core of every story are values. And if you're not living those values, you really don't have a story to tell. So I think there's enormous hope in the fact that marketers need to be storytellers, stories need to be based on values and make audiences heroes. And uh, that's gonna help us change the media landscape and let these more positive messages rise to the surface. And we'll talk a little bit today about how to use these tools to, to make that happen. Thank you, Jonah. Yeah, looking forward to diving into that more deeply. I want to introduce Jesse Shapens. So our second presenter is um, a media theorist, documentary artist, and a social entrepreneur. And um, Jesse Shapens is uh, running a, a company called Ziga with a really, uh, really unusual and diverse team of technologists, architects, and artists, multimedia uh, documentary artists. And um, they're located out in Cambridge. They're funded in part uh, from the Harvard Berkman Center on the Internet and Society. They're funded from a substantial grant from the Knight Foundation and a number of other clients. And um, they're a hybrid model of nonprofit and for profit as a, as a media venture. And so it's, you know, Jesse wears a lot of hats and, and uh, he, he, can, he can get on a lot of panels because um, <laughs> he can work in a lot of directions. I'm, I'm pretty blown away by. Um, you know, what Jonah and, and Free Range have done in their space, and I'm pretty blown away by what Jesse Shapens and Ziga have done in their space, and that's what motivated me to make those phone calls and say, you know, these are the, these are the two people I want to have at SOCAP. I want to read you just a little bit from Ziga's mission statement because it's pretty unusual. The internet is a wild place. We like that. We like that. Too often, though, it's overwhelming and full of too many choices. Little by little, we want to help remake the internet to make it a more beautiful place to make the web's wilds accessible to anyone for new forms of creative expression. Ziga is a community of makers passionate about creating immersive experiences that combine original content with media from across the web. So the scale of the projects that Ziga is undertaking are, are literally uh, from the smallest idea generation up, up to the largest potential scaling that you can imagine. The partners that they engage with are people like Mozilla and Vimeo and SoundCloud and um, yeah, just, uh, just a host of really interesting people at the, at the, the forefront of uh, the web and its, its uh, functionality and its tools. It's an opportunity for, for 
crowdsourcing within a curated container for empowerment, a flattened authorship, a transparency where people get dirty making media in a sense and have an experience and magnetize a community and learn about co collaboration by, uh, by actually working together to express themselves to each other. So I, I know we're going to dig in more and what we're going to see is that there's these two fascinating worldviews here and two fascinating models. They're both successful. They're both uh, effective, and yet I find them very, very different, particularly when we look at where do you locate the, the mission, uh, the social good at the heart of the DNA of each of these ventures. And I want to talk about that after Jesse uh, makes an introduction. Jesse Shady. <laughs> Microphone falling on the ground. Um, well, thank you so much, Jeff, and it's an incredible honor to be here at SOCAP. And it really is an incredible honor to follow somebody like Jonas Sachs. I followed his work and his studio's work for, for many years. Um, and there's, there, may, there certainly are differences, but uh, I don't know, there's, there's definitely an underlying inspiration that definitely cuts through our, through our, through our practices. Um, so what I wanted to do today um, is talk a little bit about Ziga. Um, Jeff has already done a tremendous job introducing our work. Um, and then talk a little bit about our kind of philosophies of storytelling and the landscape today online. So, just to kind of get started, um, Ziga is a platform for inventing new forms of interactive storytelling. And the mission is really to empower online a creative expression for anyone. Um, and I think this is really vital. It's important in terms of the question of social good, um, really thinking about creative culture and expression and the tools for creative expression as being vital social, um, social values that are really crucial to support and to grow. So one of the things that this then points to, and this may be a kind of a bold jump, um, but I think it relates actually closely to, to, to the video and, and what Jonah talked about. I think one of the big misconceptions that we have today in the context of sort of a, a, a post-broadcast world is that authorial voices are being lost. Um, I think that a lot of the work that we do is with journalists and filmmakers, people trained, media makers trained in great storytelling, telling powerful narratives. I think that that experience and that perspective is extremely important today. Um, I think that it's changing the ways that we see that operating. And in particular, the way that I think we like to think about this dynamic is the traditional media model, the maker and the author is really an experienced sort of expert in the frame, you know, designing a sort of video that really kind of very succinctly, clearly frames a topic and a message and distributes it out. Um, and we understand that all media is inherently framed. There is that perspective. I think the big shift that we're seeing online today is an increasing shift to authorial agency around frameworks. Um, and the difference there is really taking initiative around designing a structure that is finite, it is constrained, but it's open. It's open for creative expression, and there's open for chance within a really kind of thoughtful, thoughtful structure. So to, to put a little texture to that, um, I want to talk about a project that um, my partners and I, Kara Oler and James Burns and Ann Hepperman, created in 2008 called Mapping Main Street. So this project started four years ago in the context of the last election. Um, you had Obama, McCain talking about Main Street versus Wall Street. And what occurred to us is that Main Street wasn't just some abstract people or place. That there were literally streets named Main all across the United States and had this idea of this wild notion of what would it look like to create a collaborative documentary that told the stories of every street named Main Street. So this is a little video that introduces the project. Can we get volume on that? There's beautiful, fantastic music. There we go. <laughs> I'm here on Main Street in the City Metro Diner. We're in Lexington, Virginia. Lucia, Montana. In Navasota. You'll have been to Arizona on Main Street. When you think about living on Main Street, you think of all the little shops, Fourth of July parades, an ice cream vendor on the corner. You picture in your mind a place. Our particular Main Street, the Main Street. connects United States and Mexico. It's a bunch of hoes and drug dealers. That's all I know about Main Street. Good place to start a business. It's a true small town community spirit. There ain't much. You can as far as it goes right there. <laughs> of a series of audio documentaries broadcast on NPR, so professionally produced investigative stories. And then this website, which continues to operate today, 
where, um, and here's the look at the site now. So you have these stories, these kind of featured works. Um, this one happens to be in Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, where Main Street is primarily a prostitution strip. Um, a story that we told there of um, a couple that met and live on Main Street and are homeless. Um, and now we're moving around, looking at the different content that's been contributed from across the country around different topics all on Main Street. So this is actually a little bit more playful topic, but we're looking at all media related to animals on Main Street. Um, and what we're about to see is actually a series of photographs by somebody named Amy Fitchter um, in Iowa. Um, she's somebody that found out about this project and was deeply inspired and took it under her own kind of inspiration to go out and photograph over 45 streets in her region, places that she'd driven through but had never stopped, organized her own photo exhibition. And that really points to, in this world of the kind of new potentials of storytelling, what I love the most is that it creates context for the emergence of the unexpected. When you design a framework that has real kind of narrative drive and hook and inspiration, you capture people and they do things that you have no idea what they're gonna look like. And that's what's so fun about it. It's also what's daunting and so different than a broadcast model. It's really setting up that structure though that makes sense and is engaging. You know, we could have done a project called Mapping A Street and nobody would have cared. I mean, it's a weird kind of like, oh, weird topic. You know, those are some strange like urban geographers, but nobody really cares about A Street. Main Street is what matters. It has resonance. There's a real kind of power to it. And thinking of those frameworks, those narrative frameworks that capture people is really challenging, but I think really one of the most exciting creative prospects we have today. Um, and in that sense, what's really important to think about is that in the context of social change, that engagement is also authored. Although there is the context now where there's openness around participation, it doesn't mean you just say, you know, share stories and everybody's gonna come, you know, to your, to your storytelling you know, platform and, and tell you stories related to your mission. It's really about designing that. And so this is another project, this is not one that myself or my colleagues have been involved in, but one that I just absolutely love called the Johnny Cash Project. Um, and this is a documentary film that was then animated about Johnny Cash. And what you're seeing now are individual frames that are drawn by a community that's been invited to participate. And so below there, you see all these different individual kind of interpretations of a single frame in the film. And what we're about to see is how participation actually works here. So what they designed is a mechanism by which anybody can see the original frame and then draw on top of it. Um, so we're just watching the film, but uh, it skipped ahead. Anyhow, it's a great site. We can go to it sometime. But really what's important there is to create structures for people to succeed in contributing, to not just have it be a totally open, wild landscape, and to be simple. Simplicity around this stuff is so important and to limit choices. Um, so just a little bit more on Ziga. What we're really aiming for then is to, to create a platform that enables makers to actually author frameworks. We've seen a lot of great platforms today online that allow people to author media, to share media, to post videos to YouTube. It's a whole different animal to think about actually a platform that lets individuals that don't have the resources for technology and huge budgets to actually author frameworks that invite participation. So this is an example of a project that um, we just launched with partners in Boston at WGBH um, and AIR and produced by Val Wang called Planet Takeout. And we have a little audio on this one too. Um, you go to the site and you're immediately in a takeout. We just saw that. Um, and then you have the ability to click into and start to hear and see stories from different folks at these takeout restaurants. So the notion is takeouts, a very simple kind of structure as an organizing principle for gaining a, a perspective into the changing lives of cities. Um, and so here are different folks connected to Yum Yum, a takeout in Boston. And here's now an overview of all the different takeouts that are part of the project, organized by place as well as by topic. So here we're looking at the regulars, a really kind of classic uh, category of visitors. And here we're going to then see a short video, um, a short narrative. When you spend as much time inside of Chinese takeouts <laughs> as I do, you start to notice some <laughs> patterns. So. Like every takeout has its regulars. Peop so I pause that. Um, there's a map, um, and what's important here, again, is that this is authored by somebody without technology experience, and this is running, and it's available for people to contribute from Flickr, Vimeo, SoundCloud, um, new takeouts around the country. We're interested in mapping takeouts here in San Francisco. Um, and just to jump ahead, this is managed then through a user interface that's extremely accessible. So this is all the tech content from many different sources that Val, the producer, is able to access. She's able to see all the takeouts. They're mapped. They have tags. And then she's able to set up these sort of collections around the different locations and around topics. So there, what we're looking at now is regulars. 
Um, so she had the agency to say regulars is, a, is an important topic within this larger framework um, and to create that system. So that's a lot. Um, hopefully it made sense. It's fun sharing. Um, thank you. Thank you, Jesse. So you can see we've got two fantastic backdrops against which to start to explore storytelling um, as a narrative tool. And if this video gets to be too busy. It's OK. They're not seeing it. It's OK. okay. It's just for us. It. Okay. Maybe it's, it's too busy us. for us. No, that's perfect. <laughs> I'm hypnotized. It works. Yeah. Um, let, I, want, I, I was gonna, just about to ask Jonah a question about values and, and, and sort of uh, archetypes and storytelling, but I want to just start with you, Jesse, based on what you were just sharing around Ziga's tool. Do you view Ziga's tools as having positive values in and of themselves, or is there a way to contextualize that? Wow, that makes a, more sense. That's a great question. Um, I think, I mean, I would love to believe that, that there's a way to design tools in a way that, that carry a mission and a purpose in their design inherently. Um, I think that's possible. It might be a crazy idea, but I think it's possible. I think a big part of that is actually the constraints and the kind of character that the tool has. And more than anything almost, it's actually also the initial frame and the framework of the tool and how the story is told and the community that starts to form around it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're working very closely with partners that have a really similar sensibility about new forms of storytelling. And that work is really driving and building the identity of the tool. And even though the tool itself is a piece of technology, that conversation, that story around it, is inescapable. Mm -hmm. And in that spirit, follow-on question is, I, I've heard you talk before about just how important it is to, even though make, you know, making this accessible and simple is one thing, but doing that well is another. And how there's a lot made out there, there's a lot of proliferation, but in order to tell good stories, the framework itself is, has a lot of thought put into it and design. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think this, and this is something I'm sure Jonah can speak to, um, you know, in great depth, is that to, to really identify kind of that essence, that kind of that, those kind of core, those core values, that kind of essential quality, um, which I think you need in a framework, you know, as well as a frame, whatever kind of vocabulary we choose to play with, to get that in a way that has real resonance is really, really difficult. Um, and I think one that is not only, it's one level to kind of achieve that around a specific message, it's another to achieve it in a way that is open enough that a community feels invited and excited and that they have their own agency, but it's also constrained enough that they don't feel intimidated and overwhelmed. So there's this really fragile balance um, that's challenging to achieve. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So, Jonah, um, you know, we're sitting here uh, with the creator of uh, Story of Stuff and The Matrix and over 100 other unbelievable films that really pioneered a space. How do you see the positive values coming through these multimedia ventures? Uh, how are, you know, or do you hold it that way, that they're being communicated in that way? Is that a fair way to talk about it? Yeah, I, I think when I first started, my goal was just to get stories based on values out into the world. So, you know, the matrix overthrowing the tyranny of factory farming seemed in itself, uh, the, 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 the act of telling and spreading that story was an act of spreading new values so people could see their food differently and, and create new rituals in their lives about how they ate based on new knowledge. But I think what I didn't realize that, just like in Jesse's work, there's another level of, value, of values that you're embedding in how you tell stories. When you have to partner with your evangelists, when you don't have any tool to reach the world like a big broadcast machine, you have to go out and arm the choir, as I say, the people who care about the issue, with something that they can use to then open up their networks and then pass it virally through more and more networks. It's, a, it's an act of respect for your audience, it's an act of partnership for your audience, um, and it's an act of empowerment for your audience. And you have to tell stories fundamentally differently. So when you own a broadcast machine, you can threaten 50 million people with insecurity and with the touch of a button, and they literally cannot do anything about it. They can't comment or embarrass your brand in response. They have to sit there because they're waiting for their show to start again, and they have to take it. Now, when you say, okay, you have 100,000 other th things you can look at, and what I want you to do is I want you to clog your friend's inbox with, with the message that we both share caring about, mm -hmm. you better respect them. You better give them the power to care, talk about what they most value, and you better help them build social currency around something that matters to them. So the whole way that you approach audiences is completely and fundamentally mm -hmm. different. And mm -hmm. I think that that kind of approach between 
broadcaster, if you will, an audience is a far more um, generative, positive force in the world than what we saw in the broadcast model. Uh -huh. So is this what you mean when you talk about storytelling as being more than a messaging tool? Is that where you're going, in a sense? Well, storytelling has always been a, the, the, the mechanism by which human be beings share values. Mm -hmm. right? The reason that my two-year-old climbs in my lap and asks me literally 25 times a day for a story is that he wants to know what's important to our family. He wants to know what's important to our tribe. And he doesn't want me to just tell him. He wants me to illustrate in the world what matters. And we never outgrow that. Mm -hmm. So if you're telling a story, like I say in the video, you are illustrating, a, you're, you're putting characters in conflict and plot in, on a stage to illustrate a core truth about how the world works. That's the moral of the story. And that moral of the story is based on values, what's important in the world and, what, and what's not. And so if I tell you a story and the deep moral is, he who hesitates is lost, mm -hmm. you're gonna walk away valuing risk and adventure and reward. If I tell you a different story and the moral of the story is um, better safe than sorry, mm -hmm. I'm transmitting those values of safety and security. So there's no such thing as a, as a good story that doesn't transmit values. Mm -hmm. Now, which values we choose to transmit, that's what's up to us and it's the culture that we're going to be building, the storytelling. So, so when, when say, a, a corporation like Nike utilizes uh, mythologies of empowerment, like Just Do It, which you refer to in your book mm -hmm. in different ways, are they um, empowering stakeholders and citizens towards, you know, a, a, a better future or, or, or just towards a better bottom line? How, how, do you, how do you reconcile that? Okay, so you have to look at this. I, I, I chewed through my hands, my fingernails writing the book, trying to wrestle with this question for a really long time. And um, I, I think I, I, have a, I have an answer for it though. No. You have to look at that, you have to look at that question on two levels. The first is we can all agree when we look out and see our media landscape that it, it is doing great harm. These, these, these inadequacy marketing messages, these consumer messages that make us feel insecure and then go buy something to feel better. We all agree that that's not good for our kids, that's not good for us, right? Mm -hmm. So if we could change that landscape just in the 3,500 messages we receive the day to something that's more empowering, mm -hmm. that's a good in itself. And yes, Nike is doing that, right? Mm -hmm. So Nike comes along when every other product says, let's make it easy for you, let's make it convenient. Nike says, actually, no. Not only is it gonna be hard work, not only is it gonna be difficult, but everything that you need, this is one of their tags, is inside of you, not mm -hmm. inside of our product. Mm -hmm. That does make, has undeniably made millions of people get out their asses and do something better in their lives. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, okay, that's one level. Mm -hmm. Is it deceptive? Is what Nike stands for um, true to that message? Now the fascinating and wonderful thing I think about brand storytelling is that the more you use empowerment marketing, which is what I call this type of marketing, the more you use it, the more iconic you become. And throughout all of history, even before the uh, digital era, iconic mar uh, empowerment marketing has created these iconic brands like Obama and Apple and Nike. Hmm. The more iconic you become, the higher the expectations are for you. The reason we all associate Nike with sweatshops and human rights abuses is not because they were the worst actor, because they were the brand that people most loved and wanted to love, hmm. and so they came under that fire and coming under that fire has made them a more better corporate citizen. So they led with a story that maybe wasn't entirely authentic, they led with a story and values that wasn't authentic, that caused the audience in this new transparent era to wave the flag and say, hey, that's not real, which caused them to become one of the most sustainable companies in the world now. It's a beautiful kind of cycle. It's not as easy to lie as it used to be, and that's why I say those who tell and live the best stories will rule the future. Okay, really interesting. So Jesse, question. Uh, Playing, riffing off a little bit of this interplay, you know, mm -hmm. between sort of the, the consumers and the producers of, mm -hmm. of, of media and stories. Yeah. Uh, can you can you talk a little bit about that balance you were alluding to, the the, the deft guiding hand and the free play of uh, the user? And, yeah. and 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 is is it is you know sometimes you do things and then later the PowerPoint comes together mm -hmm. and you're like here's what we did mm -hmm. but when you were when you were creating these things with your team yeah. you know what were the impulses and the you know what was calling you uh, you know what were the organic impulses that that you were following uh, in, in 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 divining that balance um, that's a great question I think um, so a couple of things. What the, this is just constantly charting through my mind as we're having this conversation, and maybe this gets to the answer and we'll kind of follow this, this myriad path, is I think, I think one of the most driving passions for myself and for our team in this context is actually is looking at the context of information society today, seeing an unbelievably overwhelming quantity of information, mm -hmm. choices, messages, also seeing, by and large, really kind of, although changing modes of engagement um, and relationships of you know, messengers to, 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 to recipients, consumers to producers, um, not seeing much that surprises 
and just kind of has moments of what, what the hell just happened that really took me off kilter and changed my frame of mind. And I think that there's this something that distinct in this notion of surprise that I think really motivates our work. Um, it's how do you actually engage in a world today where people are so overwhelmed with, with information? How do you do things that don't just carry a message and a social meaning, but how do you actually, there's a certain inherent value I would say today in having one's mind changed even for a moment in an experience of surprise. Mm -hmm. I would use the word delight when looking at your stuff. There's a sort of delight that happens. Exactly. Right away. Oh, that's, it's delightful to talk about Main Street. It's, it's delightful to talk about ch ch take out, Chinese takeout. It's that, it's that surprise combined with, it's not a shock, but an mm -hmm. uplift of, yeah. of joy that you get. Thank you. That's, I mean, and I think, I mean, part of the nuance there, though, and challenge becomes there is a passion and an inspiration around, I mean, a core set of social values that I think is where, where a lot of your work sits. And it's, and it's what does it mean to actually at times have a little bit of restraint around message, mm -hmm. to let a little bit more openness and delight and surprises. I think we're a little bit more of kind of like the artistic culture, aesthetic experimentation, where that sort of risk of uncertainty actually of meaning, there's ambiguity. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, you know, the Mapping Main Street project, part of I think the appeal was it actually didn't easily tell a story about championing the values of Main Street versus Wall Street. It actually had an openness and ambiguity that, was, that opened up a different channel to think about and reflect on the culture and the state of the country without sort of falling into a standard dichotomy and the standard narrative that we were used to hearing. It, it brings up a thought for me that is you know, just ubiquitous in this part of the country, which mm -hmm. is scaling. Mm -hmm. um, you can't really go, you can't even go to a Chinese restaurant without people talking about it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and I want to I hear from Jonah on this as well, but um, where do you come in on uh, when you're designing these things and when your team is, 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 is thinking about this community that's going to form uh, around these values, but also around this, this uh, sort of ability to, to create interactivity in the storytelling mm -hmm. that, that brings the individual voice in? Um, do you sit there and go, boy, we really need to uh, monetize this, or we, you know, this thing has got to get, you know, we got the night grant, but we need the, the renewed grant if we don't get more eyeballs, or, you know, metrics of impact, and, mm -hmm. and uh, if not that, then, then how do you, you know, do, do people listen to you? Because, <laughs> you, you know, if you, if you have one million instead of a hundred million uh, users, for instance. Um, well, this is sort of the cusp of the moment that we're at and exploring right now. Um, we're about to sort of release the, the tools more widely and in the process, as you know, of, of transitioning and building a hybrid model of a nonprofit and a for-profit. I think our initial inspiration around this was around scale and impact. I don't think we imagined 100 million. I think we were, if we were wildly successful, it was more the 8 million users that Vimeo has. Um, maybe crazy successful it's in the Tumblr range, who knows? Mm -hmm. That's really like, but that was part of the inspiration. And I think that the for-profit model has a lot more to offer in terms of supporting that type of scalability. Um, I think one sort of dimension in relation to that is, I think what we're, and this gets to the authoring interactivity, I think what, in some sense, one of the barriers to our success very well might be, we have this vision that we believe that there is a large population of people that actually want to have agency over authoring frameworks, authoring platforms, not just operating on the terms of platforms that are given to them. Mm. And there's a, you know, it's, you know, there's the agency and empowerment that tools like video sharing and photo sharing give, mm. but there's another dimension which says we want to let people actually author how inter the internet operates. Mm. Not just be able to participate in the web, but actually edit and author the web. And that's where mm. our mission aligns with groups like Mozilla. The truly, you know, the web maker initiative is about actually really putting into the hands of people the power to understand and to change the DNA of the web. Not just interact with the web, but actually author the web itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. So, Jonah, for, for a guy in a company that, you know, is had 60 million viewers uh, see story of stuff, or, or, and, and there's a, or whatever, whatever, whatever it is. 20, 20. Yeah. thank you. Six um, <laughs> this feels pretty analog, uh, and um, it's kind of a wonderful compliment, you know, especially with the, with the art, the hand-drawn art and whatnot. And so I'm, I'm curious a little bit about scaling. Are, are you surprised that 20 million viewers is, is, is um, well, it's, it's at the top of the heap, and, um, so free range is mentioned in all these ways in conversations, not just about uh, doing this, this big work in the progressive movement, not 
you know, working primarily for, or, or maybe exclusively for nonprofit clients and, and doing it for, thir you know, more than a decade profitably, it's just really near impossible to imagine how to do that. And then on top of it, to have this scaled, you know, viral receptivity on, on some of these projects. Are you as surprised as everyone else? Or, or um, you know, can you talk a little bit about how it came to be, what the thinking was originally, and are there any lessons or takeaways from that? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's definitely surprising, and it was definitely surprising when we first, you know, I think the Matrix was the first time that we got to the 20 million mark, and uh, yeah. it was definitely surprising to, to check in every day and see another 150,000 people had seen it, and that was really exciting um, and really alluring, and this was in the days before YouTube where I think we thought we can just basically, we can be the entertainment of the internet. Let's just keep making these things, mm -hmm. you know? And um, that's, we were thinking like broadcasters, though. We, think we, we thought we had this audience that we owned, and we could just keep giving them content. Mm -hmm. And um, that's really not how it works. Um, nor is it great for social change people to be chasing the enormous impact of the 20 million view mark, which is, seems to be, which is sort of seems to be where we top out. So like mm -hmm. with um, Grocery Store Wars, which we made about organic, organic food, we got to about 25 million very quickly. Um, and, but actually, that was not good for our client. Our client was overwhelmed by that response and actually brought up all kinds of political issues within their coalition. Uh, if this too, was too much attention on their issue and what they were trying to say, um, which is another story yeah. for another time. But um, this, this pop of, wow, the world just noticed me for, for you know, my 15 minutes of fame, that's not necessarily what we all need to be chasing. And when we mm -hmm. look at scale, we look at authentic conversation, we look at authentic storytelling, we can't always be thinking about how can we draw the, the widest public to this thing because the truth is they will come to that thing and then they will dissipate to the next thing. Mm -hmm. So this is why the book, when I started to write the book, I actually, it's much more about how to build a strategy upon which everything that you do is part of an unfolding story. And how can you over 10 or 15 years of, of your organization or your enterprise be, for those people who most love you and stick with you, be a story that's richly imbued with meaning that they can carry and move on to the next thing. And then there's your, your the, the relationships, the depth of the relationships and the power that you can get from that um, is much more important than have you touched the 300 million people, you know, that like a, a cat falling in a toilet might mm -hmm, get, because mm -hmm. there's really actually no way to capture that value. Right. So I think that, you know, one of the core stories that we need to change in our society is the obsession with scale. And as storytellers, we also need to question that obsession with scale yeah. mm -hmm. and, and, and really figure out, you know, what are we, what authentically are we doing? Mm -hmm. um, and what, you know, Jesse's working in this kind of this kind of, as am I, straddling art and mm -hmm. activism, which they've always gone together, but maybe he's a little bit more on the art side, mm -hmm. but, you know, have the greatest artists of our time had the 100 million views as their goal? Or, uh, mm -hmm. and mo the answer, of course, is no. Mm -hmm. you know, so. And you've yeah. got to figure out model at the same time, which is another challenge. Jeez. So, um, let's see. In the same way that Jesse was talking a little bit about um, this, uh, this, this um, effort that goes on kind of under the water where you don't see the, the legs swimming really fast around creating the framework, around making sure the tools work in a certain way, around the, the user experience being you know, collaborative and accessible and simple, but also very, very elegant and very potent. Um, my understanding from a bit of uh, the work at Free Range and having the real honor of sitting in a room and seeing you in action when people come in with an idea, which is a mind-blowing experience, by the way, um, is that you know, to do it right, you'll, you and your team will spend days even sometimes, uh, if they're lucky, but at least a day listening to a client's, uh, you know, talk about their space, their vision, their raison d'etre. And, and so it just sounds like there's so much that's going on before you're, you're storyboarding and you're producing and you're like, oh yeah, we know, you know, we know how to translate your story. I, I, I don't see it that way. I see, I see them coming in and you're really listening and kind of reframing and recasting and listening for the key memes. Can, can you give us a little bit of insight on how that process works? Yeah, um, I think that one of the first things that we do with our clients is uh, we, use this, we use this hero's journey model. So when we're doing a story strategy, one of the first things that we do is we want to reorient them. We want to say, okay, here's, you know, tell me who the hero of your story is. Uh, tell me your story. And, and they'll usually say that, that their founder or one of the people there is the hero of their story, and their story is about how they got going and now what they're doing in the world. And so the first thing we'll do is we reframe them, say, no, the hero is the outsider. The hero probably doesn't even know about your brand. The hero is, is the powerless one in the hero's journey. The hero is your audience, mm -hmm. which, is, which is a complete, which they may nod and say, oh, we kind of, we're, we're trying to do that, but 
They don't know how to do it. No one really is doing that. So how do I make the hero the audience and then understand that the hero is going to be this kind of reluctant hero. They don't know they're a hero. Moses is 80 years old when God calls him to go back and free the slaves. And he's like, I'm a stutterer. I can't go. I'm scared. Not me. It's not me. Right. So we have to approach our audiences in that way. So the first thing we ask them to do is to write a letter about the broken world that they live in, how their values are not being met and, and lived out in the voice of this audience member. And the, the conversation that happens around that is a, is a stepping out of the inward focus that most organizations are working on. And then we then ask them, well, in, from the framework of this hero to be that you are calling to greater action, and with you as the mentor, what values, not the operating values that you work with in your office every day, but what values can you share with this person and help them live out more fully and richly? And how do you make those values not the transactional values of just, I need to be safer, I need to be more esteemed by my colleagues and friends, I need more money, but how can you help them reach for those transcendent values? And the kind of stuff that, they, that comes out of that gets very rich. And then we move them into this archetype thing, which is sort of like, what is that core, you know, again, in the Moses story, when God comes down and tells Moses to go free the slaves, Moses, the first thing Moses says is, what is your name? Mm -hmm. And they have to sit for seven days. This is God, but Moses mm -hmm. won't do it unless he knows God as a mm -hmm. human being. And in the Christian uh, tradition, they, the, what would Jesus do is the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's like, not what, the, what does the teaching do, but what does that man do? What does that person do? And that's what people want out of these brands that are telling them. They want to know the storyteller. Mm -hmm. So using archetypes, you can figure out what is the voice of our storytelling. Mm -hmm. Once we are starting to build around that, then we can talk about, once we know our values, we know what, what core truths we're standing for, we know our, our voice, um, mm -hmm. then we can start talking about how do we tell our story to the world. And it becomes much more aligned. Because one thing that's just so important, and I see it the same in Jesse's work, it, it's like if you're sitting down to hear a story, or you're watching a movie, every detail of that story has to be clean, delightful, and keep you in under the spell of that story. Mm -hmm. So, and this is like same with user interface goes with this as well. It's like, oh, this is really cool. I'm being sucked in. And then there's some janky user interface mm -hmm. or some yeah. character that comes along and you can't act. Yeah. Or the storyteller like loses, can't do that voice yeah. they're trying to do. You the spell is broken. So really having, we have to work with our clients very much to understand, to understand the story before they go out and tell it into the world because it's so easy to break the spell of a story. Makes but so if you can hold sense. it, you can rock people's worlds. So. And it just resonates at this universal level. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, before we run out of time, I want to see if there's some questions. I really want to uh, allow people to participate. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. Bjorn's got a mic. He's on it. Thank you. Scott Kleiman. I'm an MBA student at Duke University. Um, for both Jonah and Jesse, but I guess perhaps Jonah first, what are the implications of this for thinking about how to segment an audience? It's uh, so echoey up here. Yeah. Can you just maybe say it? Yeah. What are so, the implications? reality how do you think about that yeah so this is really a ongoing challenge um, but it's a great question so you don't have one type of audience maybe your audience is investors uh, partners customers uh, on and on and on or maybe your audiences are, are moms and also kids whatever that that may be but you have the best brands and do not wear two masks, don't have two faces. You want to be able to consistently communicate and you can't control the, ch you can't segment and say, we'll send this message over to the moms and this message to the kids because information flows freely now. Mm -hmm. So you have to find that key audience and if you say, okay, look, if I'm speaking really effectively to those microfinance grantees, the funders are gonna see how effectively I'm speaking and be inspired. Now that means, thanks to the beauty of interactive media, the funders can go off to their little side of the site and find more information. But who, how, can I be, how can I tell one story that in its success will rally the entire community around that story? So I'm sure with your stuff, you don't tell stories with the Knight Foundation as your core audience. You tell stories so that the Knight Foundation says, whoa, these guys really know how to speak to the mm. X you know, community. So I would say that figuring out if we nail that one thing, it's going to really impress the hell out of those other heroes. That's, that's where I, I like to start because it can be completely overwhelming to be like, Hey kids, check this thing out. And be like, we know kids. We can, blah, blah. you know, that really does not work, and it's yeah. unmanageable for almost any brand. So, awesome. Really hard. You want to jump in, Jeff? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. Um, I would have said something very, very similar. And I think, um, I mean, another dimension to that, I think, is is also what we found is really also just living that story through a team and sort of the interaction of your project in a community, um, which is to say that you know your team itself 
you know, embodies different communities and different kind of segments of a potential audience. And actually building a diversity into a team that is working daily on that story, on that project, I think really offers sort of a, a mechanism to ensure that there is, a, there is kind of a multiplicity of perspectives, but you are kind of coming up with a central story that really kind of resonates out. And I think that in that process as well, that, that diversity of getting yourself out into different contexts, not into every possible context, but also sort of living out a network that is also authentic and intuitive, talking to, you know, talking to people that you feel connected to around the story that you're telling. Yeah, it makes sense. Other questions? I can't see so well. Okay, please. Hi, Christy George. I run New Media Ventures. I've got a question for both. You, can you hear? Yeah. Yeah. Without yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I have a question for both Jonah and Jesse. Uh, Jesse, in terms of Ziga, you mentioned a few different things as your sort of where you all are at right now. Yeah. Is it that you are trying to chase more users, trying to get more use cases, trying to figure out financing? What's the next step? Um, and Jonah, I appreciated what you said about people chasing the 100 million views or 25 million views. From your perspective, what is it the thing? What is the thing that people should be chasing? Is it action? Are those views toward something else? Or what's what is what are those views toward? Um, sure. So um, quickly, I mean, we're. Where we're at in terms of our, our work is we received the Knight Foundation grant um, a little over a year ago and have been hard at work assembling a team in the kind of initial alpha product, which we have a, a limited user community around right now um, that's been fantastic to interact and to learn from and to push the development. We've been working on that level as well as having a sort of division of our group that is a certain sense an R&D lab for innovative storytelling projects, where we ourselves bring our creative capacity to bear, working with filmmakers, radio producers, journalists, on a series of interactive documentary productions around the world. Um, and what we've found is that those two things are extremely complementary in this sort of first year of experimentation, but that over time, those models actually are challenging to do simultaneously. The kind of creative productions, very intensive on the human resources and human capital, um, doesn't scale very effectively but extremely rewarding and important, and also very great for learning. The product um, is something that I think, we, as I said, when we got into this, we really wanted to see have a large impact. So we're moving the product technology into the for-profit, going through developing the model, financing around that, and continuing to operate the nonprofit, but at a somewhat smaller scale in terms of the number of productions. Um, I, you know, what people should be after, I think, with storytelling, of course, you know, is engagement on some level depending on what their theory of change is, and we spend a lot of time with our clients on theory of change. But I would say what the holy grail is in, in my mind, and what the most amazing brands have done, is they create new myths. They create new identities for people so that they see their actions aligned to uh, everything they do in the framework of the story that you're telling. I mean, where, where I've seen the, the counterpoint to, st to Grocery Store Wars, which was a great success as a storytelling project, but not as a changed project, is, is a story of stuff where you know Annie got out there and she reached millions of people, but really what it did was for millions of people, they didn't just click off, they thought of themselves differently. They, told, they started telling their own story to themselves in a different way. And it did exactly, we built all kinds of interactivity tools into that project, and they got a lot of you know, clicks and take actions, but it wasn't about how many take actions can we get or how big can we build our list. It was, can people actually think differently when they go to the store? Can they vote differently? Can they find each other in community and create new identities? Because all the consumer brands out there are allowing us to like, express ourselves and express our sense of identity through their products. As social enterprises, we also have to do that, and that's the process of, of myth-making, um, which I write a lot about in the book, and I think that should be the ultimate goal. It's not the easiest thing to, to fund, it's not the easiest thing to measure, but it, it can be done. I've seen it done, and it's beautiful. Oh, so. Awesome, Jonah. We're gonna, have to, we're gonna have to stop and get in the hook. This has been so great. I just wanna say thank you, Jonas Sachs, Jesse Shapins. Thank you.